I am Natalia, uh, Assistant Curator of South Asian Art here at SAM. In collaboration with the educational team, um, and many thanks to Jason Porter, it's my pleasure to host a virtual conversation with artists Mitsu Sen and Bonnie Abidi to discuss their work um, and uh, within the exhibition in Body Change, South Asian Art Across Time. These two contemporary artists explore the intersection of gender stereotypes, structures of power, and self-representation. These two internationally known artists will provide a fascinating look in their, into their artistic practice um, and process of capturing ephemeral gestures of the body. I will introduce each speaker and then each in turn will present a brief overview of their practice. And after each presentation, I will moderate some questions. <laughs> to introduce our first speaker and a work that you may be familiar with, which is in the exhibition, Bonnie lives and works both in Berlin and in Karachi. She employs a unique approach to form in each of her works, which are individually crafted to their subjects. Bonnie's works have been focused on the contemporary conditions of Pakistan and its immediate region, particular issues of security, the idiosyncrasies of democracy, the peculiarities of urban and social change, and the instru instrumentalized patriotisms that underline the relationship between Pakistan and India. And I'll say also her work bridges that geography as well, um, talking about power more generally. More recently, um, Bonnie traveled and practiced in many different parts of the world. And her work has also focused on negotiating culture and belonging, explored memory and imbalances in the telling of histories. In describing her work generally, Bonnie has said, quote, it is about people, politics and history, end of quote. In the Embodied Change exhibition, Death at a 30 degree angle, and these are install shots um, not at SAM, but in other uh, exhibitions where you get a different sense of the work, which tells a fictional story of a local politician who commissions a sculpture of himself, but is dissatisfied with its various iterations. Uh, Bonnie has said he can't decide if he should be portrayed as an intellectual, a warrior, or a politician with a garland around his neck. Um, most recently, uh, this work not only has been shown at SAM, but in her SO exhibition, which is still running at MCA Chicago, which opened in on September 4th, 2021, and is still running um, and will close in June 5th, 2022. So for those who find uh, Bonnie's work so captivating, please take the time to go to Chicago um, and see the rest of her wonderful work. The next artist, um, Mitu Sen, performs conceptual and interactive multi-format byproducts, which include drawing, poetry, moving images, sculpture, installations, sound, and others. And in Embodied Change, you see uh, one of her photographs that are painted over, but her practice is wide ranging and manifests in human interactions, employing the medium of life, to actualize art production. Through radical hospitality, lingual anarchy, counter capitalism, untaboo sexuality, and unmonolith identity, Me Too persistently explores the void of in betweenness where unconstructs dwell, waiting to be unrealized. Her work often dwells with the complexities of the body and its physical erotic and sexless forms. The erotically and emotionally charged self or figurative imageries as a matrix of identities and myth, questioning societal norms, fixed belief and categorizations. Me too, um, as just as Bonnie has been widely exhibited in many museums and galleries, most notably at the Guggenheim, the Tate, uh, Queens Museum, Peabody Essex and DACA Art Summit. And with that, I'll stop share and hand it over to our first speaker, Bonnie Abidi.
Hi, everybody. Am I? Um, let me just share the screen. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be actually, uh, thank you, Natalia. This is very lovely. I just also realized while listening to, while seeing our biographies that Mitu and I are both 1971 born. So that's interesting. Uh, I didn't know we were the same age. Um, so it, um, it's, it's lovely to be, I'm really sad I'm not there for the exhibition and um, seeing all through COVID time, seeing a lot of things and works go up at a distance um, on Zoom is kind of surreal, but every uh, possibility to actually uh, engage and talk about it is also very, very welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about um, um, works that are not, this not the work that is in the exhibition, but uh, two um, as sets of um, uh, artist books that I have worked in the past and um, that have to do with things that uh, the show also deals with, which is the human body. Um, and in this case, it's going to be about the body and uh, silence or censorship or um, uh, an amnesia. Um, and the, let me just start my... So, um, this is a project called I Love You, um, which is the, which, and it's a book, it's a set of books that deal with uh, the silence of a romantic love and surrounding shyness and silence and privacy surrounding romantic love. And it's a, it's a very lighthearted project that I did uh, with a group of friends of mine with whom I was part of an artist residency. And I basically took my video camera and I recorded multiple uh, people saying, mouthing the words, I love you. Um, I'm going to play it for you here. And, uh, and it was an interesting, I mean, I was interested in working with, uh, with flick books because of uh, the fact that I work with video and I had always uh, wondered whether there was a more, um, an easier way to distribute video uh, where people could actually feel the, uh, move it and manipulate time in their own hands. And um, somehow the form um, and the content, which is was about silence, made um, uh, perfect sense. And the, in this particular project, what I did was that I made all these flick books and gave them to people to give to people they, they loved. Or, so these were actually gifts that I gave to the people I had made videos of. Um, but it made me, I think this is one of, this was from 2000, initially when I made it, it was 2003 or four. So it is a very old work. And I, I realized that uh, I continued working with um, questions related to, uh, to silencing. There are many works that I've done, um, uh, which, which deal with um, these issues. One of them is the Memorial to Lost Words, which is, the censored letters of by, written by um, World War One soldiers, Indian soldiers, back to their families, um, asking um, kind of warning people of the horror of war. So that's a, that's one project that deals with sound um, and memory. Um, another project is the man who talked until he disappeared, which is kind of which is a set of watercolors I've done where I'm clocking. Um, the speech or uh, portraits of men as they talk. And these are contentious characters in uh, for the Pakistani state and are uh, always under the um, kind of live under the threat of being uh, picked up or, um, you know, arrested. Um, so, the, uh, but this is to say that these particular projects have not actually been exhibited or shown that much. So it's nice to be able to talk, talk about them. Um, this one is a, a um, artist book that was published by Raking Leaves, which was a London and Sri Lankan based um, artist book publisher. It's called The Speech Writer and it, it, got really, it was really inspired actually by the first project, which is the I Love You project, um, which is, this is also about silence. And um, so just to describe the form to everyone, this is a box of books, of 10 books, and each one of them is um, been all the 10, um, uh, flick books together, tell a story, but of course it's silent. Um, and so you go through um, their holes at the back, you um, push the, each book out and you um, flick through it. Um, 
this is the text um, that is about, um, that is a kind of essential to the understanding of the uh, project. Um, I'll read out um, a bit to you. And of course it alludes to the fact that there's some kind of, um, the text has a time code in it. It is relating to um, what is being said inside and the videos that are inside. So it just says I had arranged to spend Tuesday morning with him at his house. I find him crouched on his terrace floor upstairs and warm sun fixing a loose wire in his equipment. We slowly walk back indoors. Seated in his study, I ask how he started writing for others. He no longer remembers. Maybe it started in college, he tells me. I wrote a debate for my roommate who spoke well but needed help with framing his ideas. The words, the sentence, constructions and the rhetoric had all come later. I've written them all campaign speeches, victory speeches, inaugural addresses, and all the rest. Many were broadcast live to the entire nation. Those were my words that reassured and spoke of change and made promises. I made those promises. When I started out, I thought naively that writing for these people would be a good, good thing. I wrote for them and thought with them for so many years, he says wistfully, while wiping the dust off an old fire. But to what use? These ideas were just words for them. These are some of my best pieces. They were never used, he says, holding up a sheaf of papers. I was told that they spoke of more than was needed. So this is a text that is, um, um, that is I've written. And um, I'm going to show you um, a video of a hand that flicks the books. I'm kind of, I don't want to show the actual video to you guys, so I'll show the, the way the books work. But basically it is a fictional character very much. Uh, and I'm really interested in this. Uh, uh, there are many people in my li life who I um, step, take one step away from and I fictionalize them. So a lot of the, even the man who's acting for this video is somebody uh, who in actual life was similar to this. He wasn't a speech writer, but he kind of embodied this idea of a lost idealism and, um, um, being kind of irrelevant um, to society. And that's what the idea I was dealing with. And it was uh, my, my parents' um, generation is uh, the one that as teenagers um, witnessed the partition of India and Pakistan. And um, so they, they uh, I'm very interested in what a nation state meant for them. And I kind of have witnessed them losing faith in what, uh, what promises um, utopic ideas were presented to them uh, 70 years ago. So over time, and this was after my father had passed away, I kind of used to think a lot about what he had wanted. And he used to, he was very interested in writing letters to the editor, writing books, and he was very patriotic and trying to make sense of what this, these countries were and what had happened. So it's kind of based on a certain generation of um, sort of anti-imperialists who, um, uh, who were, part of the independence struggle. Um, but the text that I've written here, which is the speechwriter, alludes to, of course, all forms of irrelevance and forgotten ideologies and politics. Um, so this is the um, uh, instance of what, how it shows you. What. So of course, what is um, the leading text that you read on the cover of the book is um, a very important introduction to what uh, is the actual video. Uh, but I also think what is very wonderful about thinking about this fictional character, and in my case, uh, the, all of these characters, I usually work with uh, fictional characters. I'm not in the work, although I am in some of my work. Um, but it also um, is a very interesting relationship with the person who's controlling the book um, and you can slow it down um, as much as you want or watch it again. So I like that kind of uh, analog 
aspect of uh, experiencing time. So basically as the story I'll show you during, uh, I'll show you video stills, but um, essentially what is happening is that it is uh, an, oh, the, a gentleman who's a character um, is getting ready and is preparing for something, he's getting dressed up. And um, he slowly sets up. This is this is shot in the character who's acting. It's shot in his um, in his own study. Um, okay, so he this is uh, videos shot and then condensed into the book, and we watch him getting dressed. Uh, and there's constantly the characters talking to me uh, to the camera, which he can't be heard. Um, and I think that makes. A more sense when he, um, these are just photographs uh, and these are pan shots of his house. Um, and he's setting up something. So these are, it's very slowly, it unravels. He's referencing, this is his, his desk, he's looking at his material. There are lots of, in a lot of my work, these gestures like him scratching his foot, uh, there's a slowness of time, which I think that I, and, or rather uh, a focus on a particular moment um, or multiple moments, which uh, are important to linger on for me as a maker. I'm able to do that in, uh, with a flipbook. And then finally he starts reading something. And then as you're scanning, as, as you're flipping, you see that he's moving and he's reading. Um, and then it, on one side of the flick book, you see that there's a display of uh, speakers, uh, these mega, large speakers, uh, which are used for public events and they are outside his house. Um, and then they're just pan shots and then it cuts to, it's kind of one of the books at the end shows the street and then there's just one man standing there listening. Uh, but there's such a, a strange contrast between uh, the extent to which this gentleman inside, inside wants to be heard and, um, um, and the audience, which is actually no longer there. But there is kind of, uh, I like the, the eccentricity about the life of um, um, these, uh, about characters like him of hidden uh, silent people who have a lot to say, who have a lot to contribute um, and engage with society, but kind of have been tucked away and are no longer relevant. And I think even, um, I mean, for me living in Berlin now, I think very often about a, a lot of uh, former East Germans who are, uh, who are history teachers and, uh, you know, intellectuals who worked within the system and did believe and at some level or even critique it. Um, and how uh, the, the moment the wall uh, fell, they, they became uh, everything that they stood for or the system they'd been part of became irrelevant. So I think there are many uh, uh, similes to be drawn about the lives of uh, people um, who belong to another time um, and how they become kind of relics um, and fossils in, in, in the architecture, in urban architecture. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stop the, um, yeah, there we go. So um, I think that Natalia, it would be nice to discuss this uh, rather than I don't talk, uh, we can talk about this in relationship to Mithu's work later, um, when both of us have shown. Great, yeah, I'll hand it over to Mithu to share your screen and then after you're done, we'll join in a conversation together. Thank you. Well, um, I'm starting with the image that has been uh, right now showing in Sam. Um, it's called Miss Matthew. It's a very old work from 2006 and seven uh, from a show called Half Full. Um, okay, before I start, I must thank <laughs> Natalie for inviting me in this show and showing my work 
exam. So it's a great privilege to show with a lot of uh, friends and artist friends and colleagues. So um, I'm happy to be there, not physically because the whole world is like, like virtual now. And uh, we don't know when again in future we will be able to show together because of this state of you know numbness coming with the potential third world war. So every morning we are waking up with the fear of something again will be collapsing soon. Um, anyway, I would like to uh, take. I would, I would like to share a couple of my. Um, projects based on uh, language uh, because my, my, my practice is quite vast and complex and scattered and I'm never you know organized with a singular line, uh, linearity in my practice and um, so um, I, I, I play with the mediums and uh, practice not as a fashion or train but as a politics of my or as a statement of my um, of my journey. So as an artist, I, I like act much like a disclaimer. I, I consider my entire project, like my practice or journey as a performance and uh, my role as an anarchist or attempt to interrogate and subvert and seduce or destabilize, destabilize, destabilize a monolith construct that we unknowingly uh, accept it as a normal thing. So uh, my commitment um, towards art, which is politically, intellectually infused, poetically and aesthetically sensible and psychologically charged, only invites to unsettle the settlements. As Natalia mentioned that um, how I um, kind of uh, navigate my practice uh, for last 25 years practice uh, over a couple of conceptual pillars, like radical hospitality is one of the main platform that I constantly um, trying to explore uh, to my practice. And then definitely under radical hospitality, it's lingual anarchy, counter capitalism, unmonolith identity, and untaboo sexuality. This is where uh, I kind of roam around, and my diverse and complex practice kind of uh, try to not to be trapped in a market provocation or in a singular linearity. And that's the play. And I call my medium as earning with a play bar, like playing with labor. And all my tangible material artworks I consider as byproducts. Um, they are um, they are surfaced in different kind of different kind of mediums like drawing, poetry, sound, video, installations, um, contracts, instructional. Uh, levels, um, captions, QR code, and sometimes some projects um, I, I appear as an anonymous over four years. So this kind of play gives me a freedom and um, I, can, I can perform quite freely. Um, and I call it like a self-claimed rapture. Uh, and like an um, affirmative sabotage into this art world. And um, I, I entertain myself and um, I think I, I live my life like this and um, I enjoy it. <laughs> so I'll give you a little background of my upbringing. I was born and brought up in a small town in Bengal. Um, um, originally from Kolkata, where actually my Ambani shows. And um, I studied in Vishwabharati Shantiniketan, uh, uh, an university founded by uh, our first Nobel laureate, Rabindranath Tagore. And that school as a liberal school established an alternative global education system to counter the colonial practice during British period. 
So it was a historic movement, you know, like how the school was um, conceived. Um, after finishing my master degree, my destiny brought me to Delhi and I started confronting a different kind of experience in my life. And especially through, uh, you know, that experience of the hegemony and hierarchy of language, I felt that, you know, very alienated from this anglophonic world or the art world. And this, you know, like neither Hindi or English I could pick up easily and uh, going through like feeling judged and humiliated, defeated, frustrated um, often. So uh, my mother is a poet and I always dreamed to be a poet like her. I started writing poetry very early in my life, like at the age of four. And then I um, was actually um, writing a lot when I was uh, studying fine arts in, uh, in Shantiniketan. But when I moved to Delhi, experiencing that kind of hierarchy, you know, like the dominant power of the language uh, made me almost numb and silent. Um, not over, you know, like night, but um, slowly I realized that um, my poetry were becoming minimal, absent of shapes. So that was the animation of uh, Foster. I'll, I'll come back sometimes uh, when I'll talk with Natalie, the story behind this Miss Macho. Um, so, so this is a little unworld, and today I'll show you like how by earning or undoing, I have created or cultivated a little unworld for myself um, to protect my sanity in this world of insane. <laughs> so, um, This is my last Bengali poetry book where um, I almost was devoid of the words. And um, while designing the book, I left a couple of the pages as blank as a, as a form of poetry with nothingness, empty and devoid. So Delhi gave me Especially like, you know, after moving to Delhi, I went into uh, absolute silence with my poetry um, for a period of time, like not a small period, but 10 years. So this performance <laughs> called A Funeral Affair. So to depict that the time of silence and not being able to document or develop my poetry in any given vocabulary or script or language. I also started, you know, um, experimenting and exploring um, with imaginary scripts and to challenge the, the, the viewer's perspective towards an unknown language, um, inviting them to, to translate or to read out those imaginary scripts from their subconscious and uh, so this kind of one time imaginary script and the sticks like huge giant uh, uh, languages is almost like a pre post letter science that uh, refer to a linguistic and a cultural background. The new language was open to for reading through assumptions and associations. 
in response which I encountered varied interpretations, conclusions, and translations of a new language, and those are all mere gameplay. After 10 years of being silent, I thought of coming back to write poetry again. Um, so I started uh, typing on my little computer. And this time by accident, my whole book, which I was trying to write in Bengali um, for some techno error, um, become a glitch book. <laughs> and this time I just thought of not to stop myself from validating and acknowledging and accepting those glitches as my poetry because it was, um, it was something uh, very sincerely written, but I couldn't remember what I have all written because I went to a coder and the coder also couldn't decode them and it was permanently damaged. And I called my publisher in Calcutta who published my last book in Bengali and explained to him that I have, I have done another book, you know, and he very excitedly said that I knew that you'll come back and you'll write because a poet never dies. And uh, no matter what, I sent him this PDF and he called me after two hours saying that it's a corrupted file. Um, send me the, the, the original file, you know, like, so it's the story I'm telling because next couple of months I had to convince him how they are not corrupted or even if they are corrupted, they are the poetry and they are the real poetry and I want them to publish it. I, I mean, he, he suggested me to make it a poetry, you know, artist book because by then I was also becoming a visual artist in this art world. So he knew that and he suggested me to become, to publish it as a like, as an art form. And I said, no, because I wanted to get validated by the same publisher who believes in me, who believes in the poetry and who knew that, you know, with his acknowledgement, I can, I can establish my non-sensual glitch book as a poetry book. And I did that. I published that book from them and I started reading them and I didn't know how to read them. So I tried to evoke my subconscious. I tried to mimic the nonsense. And I tried to um, challenge the world where language is no more a barrier. And um, I started unlanguaging the construct of the dominant structure of languages, different languages or the dominant powers and the, all, all those uh, marginal languages or the suppressed languages as a voice, I started, um, you know, like um, taking out from, from within. And I also invited people to read those, those scripts and without a clue. So this, this, this whole form of non-languaging or uh, unlanguaging this, this um, gibberish form of reciting these uh, poems was a form of resistance, accepting this sonic, you know, it's more like, you know, in this, uh, it's like a primordial, you know, um, uh, language, or it's like a baby's, you know, babbling, or, or it's like, you know, in, in a phantom stories, we used to hear that how the the sound of a drum can travel to, you know, different places and alarm people or people understand. So this kind of sonic form, I really tried to explore more and more. And if not today, I just thought that those emotional sound effects can hold some kind of, a, you know, um, some kind of a substances like, you know, that which can be decoded someday. Uh, and can become a form of language. But right now it was empowering me enough as a resistance um, with this, this colonial you know, remnant of English to destabilize the language and these hierarchical institutions. So uh, 
to my in, in my intervention you know involves raising my own voice with non language the gibberish using emphatic nonsense speech often frustrating to those who sought to grasp any straightforward meaning so people came after my you know reading this poetry and say like they understood a couple of words from there and which were all nonsense because it was really not meant to be just understanding couple of words it was about embracing this unknown and the marginals or maybe a, you know like one time language so like you know that kind of performance it's like it put my audience in a situation of being numb and humiliated by their inability to understand and respond to my language i hope they will meet the limits of their liberal and conventional notions of hospitality entering to a zone of what i call radical hospitality this you know like providing the discomfort and uh, questioning and critiquing the notion of hospitality this is another project called meeti snai this is also quite interesting because here i actually from the sound of a polish um, popular uh, film i tried to create um, another story um and uh, create a, the, like the the subtitle of the whole film and it re edited re-edited the film with those new subtitles keeping the polish um sound effects and then showing it in poland so this again is like you know this uh, the linguistic reimagination and that surreal de deconstruction was uh, was uh, was uh, developing based on a new narrative that you know this with this single uh, episode uh, popular polish film so um so while i was challenging myself and that my new non language with the world i also tried to go uh, to different places uh like this one i was uh, inhabited myself in an orphanage of abused girl children in kerala another side of south india and the those girls um where they have the language which is called malayalam not a single word i understand so there i started i created a fictional character called mago which was myself and uh, i i tried to create a film over a couple of days staying over there uh, without a communication of a common language a non scripted interactive and uh, experience based uh, you know kind of initiative in this orphanage i experimented a communication started happening outside the narrow alleys of comprehensions and common language um as a product finally a fantasy film in a reality set was made hello officer <laughs> So there, it's such a long film, but you know, in different way, their curiosity or sometimes their frustration came out in different ways. So it was only one uh, little camera, like my phone camera, and me and those children who were filming each other without knowing the language of the camera so you know that doc the documenting this way with the uh, charts and um, you know, noises were also part of
a oh, statement of this kind of oh, unknown uh, situation. And one more point, even one girl was trying to translate in the basket. my non-language to her other friends and that was really very sad for me um, i think the next day i left I don't know from where she got this confidence. Um, Afasia was uh, a live performance. I was invited uh, to do a presentation within nine, like 10 minutes time. Um, with the invitation from Asia Pacific, uh, sorry, uh, Asiatic Society in New York. And, um, but the, the instructional booklet they've sent was so, um, so immense that I had to made a film out of that, those booklet and created a pre-made film of my practice. And then I presented my practice work in non-language. Jacob the meto in the on top of the stomach ho ho in only would you swing the ball you do the top leaks tomorrow in the home league of in hard go it house the cow to toasty. You know, when I was to talk with two steam bully cloud dues, you wow so do see you. Now come stop in the whole of somebody. In the house, I could never do the other. I love see my recruitly. That is the house of tow, chick of tita, in the tow step. It was up, it's like wow, do see you come, you wow. Oh, send the hard risk in the place to one still in hard or do this about it. Was cut cold through because of bar in old town in the good stuff. He was thirsty. Drop a storm soon like some push. Here, Christa, oh, kicks. They're gonna be tough. You know, somebody got ship. You know, like so three eek all this. Um, I'm a sooner gum sleep, no, so and so. You don't stop, they could start, 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 they Yes, Tommy. Oh, so look to which will which rock to which will out of the rock to you. You know, I start to put with a double of dilly come to no more was so up to do to stop to sleep. Come up, what does so you know, no after it's up. Also, I'm soon a blam like so that calls. Oh, pop some of shoes. Oh, so I'm so I'm so I'm so I'm so I could serve and flap them sleep of duty, now stay up so. Then they don't stay up in her so you cut all those up and see. I'm so extra sure. What was somebody told? He'll have a seat or be. So at the end, I had to fast forward myself because I had to show a lot of work. The time was limited. So I speed up. I know somebody's to do this. They could look up a 
So this is how I submerged, you know, like uh, the my 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 the 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 entire guidelines by, given by them, and um, I performed this controlled power and its politics, you know, the feeling of being dominated and suppressed. And then this is uh, you know Asia Pacific Trinale. I made a huge drawing installation. Uh, Me too. Can I? pause here yep. for a second i just felt like that last uh work was so wonderful um and i'm wondering if we could close your powerpoint and begin the conversation yeah, yeah true yeah please. uh oh sorry you sent me a message i didn't even uh how to stop Wonderful. And Sophie, can you spotlight uh, me too, Bonnie and me? Sorry to cut you off, me too, but just I feel with um, both your works, you could just you guys could keep going and going. And I know it's it's a shame that we can't just be in person and bounce off each other and the format of zoom is so um cumbersome in many ways no, I, I i i showed a lot i had only one side aside i think like okay. but... <laughs> um i wanted to maybe pose one or a few questions um first opening up to the question of sound um in relation to the human body which is interesting in that for both of you, the body's still present when you are capturing in some form sound. And in some artists, you know that it's just, just the sound and you don't even see uh, the human form. So me too, you talk a lot about burnt non-language um, and Bonnie, you talk about silence, but also that um, you talked a bit about that series on laughter. So can mm -hmm. you both um, Maybe say a bit about your biography of how you became interested in sound and how that has been a thorough line in your work. Um, so with me, I think that the the, the it, it kind of the, an articulation of that come came much after I had actually started working with so both the books that I produced uh, that I shared uh, are actually. Uh, coming more from the idea of silent image and silent film, because I was making tiny silent films, uh, it wasn't there in both cases, the, the narratives were, it was important that it, well, I wanted it to be about silence, as well as the fact that it is, a, because it's about a silent form. Um, but I think the interest in sound has grown over the years for uh, for different reasons. I mean, the, the, uh, and they died laughing. I mean, that's also kind of my interest in humor um, with the, uh, the watercolors. What you are describing, Natalia, is a set of watercolors I did. Um, I think it was four, four or five years ago where there's just gestures of people um, people laughing hysterically, right? And, um, and that was just, I think that was more about the agency of laughter and the power of performance. And I've been interested in that constantly. In, um, in how a, a, a certain kind of laughing at people can um, de de uh, destabilize or disempower the person who's being laughed at. Um, and that was that work was done right after a friend was, um, somebody I knew in, uh, was killed in Pakistan and um, it was very um, contentious um, the political, what the reasons were. And it could have been a politically motivated uh, killing. So it came uh, very soon after that. But I've been very interested in um, sound uh, in recent years as, um, as the relationship between sound and displacement um, and um, the, um, how, how evocative uh, music and sound is. 
um, and how it places us uh, in different locations, even though we're uh, we're traveling around. Um, so that kind of a pa parallel schizophrenic life that we have, uh, depending on what sound we hear and where we are. So that's kind of my um, set of interests, which are many from very many different angles. And Mitu, do you want to discuss a bit about um, a bit about the non-language? Because we saw various reactions, you know, in a sense we saw with the the you know orphanage um, radical hospitality being enacted by that girl translating on your behalf, and then we saw different reactions in the um, which was I think was the Guggenheim. Uh, the man, you know, you could almost see him jump a little bit when you came behind him. Um, and uh, kind of how was how was people reactions to the to the unlanguage? Well, I think, you know, you are, the humankind is like that. They always try. They are uh, fearful about the unknown. And uh, but, you know, like the, the power structure is such that they always try to show the, 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 you know, it's like, almost, I feel like, you know, I am overpowered by the Google, you know, like everything is there. And sometimes I, I encounter people and, you know, like the world who are all like this kind of a giant Google, you know, like who knows everything. And, and there is, almost like the other, the, the, to create this other is like uh, so easy for them, you know, like, and uh, how easily that, you know, the, uh, the marginal politics is uh, um, created in, 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 a, in this kind of societal construct. So uh, instead of, you know, polishing myself, and I, I was dyslexic since uh, childhood, so it's, I take it as a personal experience, but I, uh, after, uh, you know, uh, being judged and humiliated uh, you know, several times in several manner, I just had to take a language to, you know, to, to completely, you know, um, de-establish this kind of the form, that construct of that monolith identity of the language politics. And, uh, and I literally and physically and emotionally felt empowered and charged the, the moment I started uh, um, speaking in non-language, you know, as a, as a form of performance and as an art piece, as, a, as an artist performance, I was easily accepted. But that actually gave me a, a real confidence about um, that, you know, like to make a journey through this nonsense, you see, because nonsense people, um, people are still like kind of hesitant about uh, defining the nonsense and, uh, uh, and also exploring or immersing themselves into the nonsense because known knowledge is easy to, you know, acquire, but those unknowns are not. So I started. Hmm? Sorry. No, no, yeah. I just wanted to say to and me too, lis listening to that thing, I think that it's the, I'm also very interested in, I'm a, I make films and a lot of my characters are silent, but a lot of my, um, so there's no speech that kind of guides people through uh, a narrative, right? And a lot of the work is sh shot in uh, South Asia. And um, of course, being, uh, the, uh, I mean, I always say that a place like uh, a geography and uh, a place like Kar Karachi or Delhi, or, uh, I think more largely in terms of South Asia, that this is kind of my material and this is not, it's on, my work isn't about this, but this is the language I know. Yeah, This is my language to tell a story. These people, this skin color, this um, earth color, blah, blah. But, uh, and I also am very interested in the idea of how because a lot of uh, contemporary art um, exhibition and funding structures still are very based in a kind of uh, north, uh, northern and global south. I mean, the dynamic is still kind of maintained how there's always a desire to translate, yeah? to translate ourselves. 
and to explain um, so the, the presence of the didactic text, what is a didactic text, and how important and crucial it becomes when the work is from somewhere outside of the Western context or the North, um, you know, Northern uh, European and American context. Um, and I really uh, now we, um, actually advocate untranslatability or, or, or you know, that things are not entirely translatable. And I think there has to be, there's something very scary about the, um, about the assumption that everything should be explained to us as an audience, um, that it should be explained to us, we should understand it. Which means that you uh, dissolve your um, all uh, responsibility to try, because it should be explained to you. So I think untranslate. The one has to make a case for unrecognizable, untranslatable, um, and you obviously take it on fully. Like that is what you make work about, and it's very interesting. But I feel that we all grew up um, reading and learning about world culture, and one had to really try hard. When I was reading, you know, South American uh, fiction, I didn't know so much, but I had to learn about it. I didn't write to tell South American writers, tell me you please give me an explanation, and then I'll read your book. Yeah? But I think the other way around, when you're showing in um, uh, here in Europe or in North America, there's such an emphasis to explain. You know, there's, yeah. a, there's a, and it's a, it's a huge, I, I personally feel it's a huge pressure, you know, like while, and um, therefore, you know, like last couple of years, I have, uh, I have declared and, and, and with a, a semi-legal contract paper that all my tangible form of art material or art products are byproducts. And I am not, uh, I'm not answerable to explain what my main product is because that's the play with the market and the market marketability because the people always go for the main product and byproducts are always like devalued like kind of it's not mm -hmm. so when i declare that these are the byproducts are my art or the all my artworks are byproduct and there is a confusion and there is a you know um because the consumption of that main product is like you know um erased and so again, that kind of anxiety and the insecurity of not having and not capitalize something is like it's it's a it's a play. And uh, what you were saying about that uh, the translation is like uh, so. Uh, if you allow me to show a one minute video that I wanted to show that because when I was pressurized to explain everything and my inability or lack of you know kind of articulation or language i just started feeling so nervous that you know i accept my non-language um uh, performance or uh, sometimes like sitting quietly and trying to play with the translation of my non-language can be an answer so i i would like to share that one just uh, can you see the yeah, this one. So, so how I can become a successful artist. Just click the top of 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 the it was really interesting to me too because actually we couldn't see the slide but we could hear um, oh, no. uh, so it kind of it kind of goes to that question i started in the sense that both of you capture <laughs> sound or the absence of sound through the human body versus you know other artists you just have pure sound um, but I wanted to pick up on something you both said about translation. And it was interesting, um, Bonnie actually was not familiar with your clipbooks, 
and they were so exciting to see um, and to hear you both, you know, I gave you both an open prompt and you both talked about books. Um, so I was wondering if you guys could discuss uh, maybe kind of your gravitation to books. Is it about, and Bonnie, you talked about a little bit about kind of the touch and the human participation with the form. Um, if you guys could talk a little bit about the book form and what drew you to it. I mean, I think that I have just done, um, I've done these and I think that I would do more because it's a phenomenally different. I mean, A, it, the idea of doing artist books in limited edition, which was very popular at the time is increasingly, you know, in a very gallery oriented art uh, um, distribution world. Um, it is very nice to produce artwork that is, uh, you can buy it for 25 euros and it lives with you in your house. And so the, all of that, uh, the politics of artists' um, editions. Um, and I think it is this, the idea, the fact is that I work with very small moments. So they are, I'm, I'm all, a lot of my videos are about gestures. Um, and I think the longest video, which is at, actually death um, at a degree angle, which is showing um, at the museum is the longest video I've done. So I'm, I'm okay. The book, the flick book is perfect in its uh, economy of time for me. And you can actually, depending on how many frames you put on a book, it can be very, very slow or it can be incredibly fast. So that's how click books work. Um, so they work. And, and in this case, it's becoming increasingly, it was uh, for Twitter's um, relationship that I had with silence, that I was interested in, um, in, in silence or censorship um, um, and, and or the act of silencing. Um, which worked well with the silence of the click book and the fact that you can only hear the paper clicking was a nice uh, substitute for dialogue. Um, so it, I haven't done that many, but I think today when I was preparing this, I was also thinking that it is a lovely way to, to, to distribute the moving image. Um. I think for me, book, because, you know, I, as I mentioned, like my mother is a poet, so I grew up with books and, you know, like, and her books. And so, of course, you know, like I could read those poetries because it was in Bengali. But uh, at the same time, I, I very romantically remember how I smelled those books, you know, like, um, and uh, I started thinking when I started writing in uh, glitches and, um, uh, imaginary scripts, which is not readable, that how a book as a as an object or as a, as a something that you can you can feel, you know, your sensory, you know, kind of uh, nerves evokes to touch it and feel it and smell it because we are told not to smell poetry or eat lights or something like that. Those constructs in our mind, which actually create kind of a myth, and. My, my experiment of uh, experiment or my um, interest on unmeeting those kind of constructed myths is like one form of book is also like that. So when I published the book with the glitch um, text and uh, our cognitive mind definitely um, asked us to read it or, you know, like kind of something that you, you, you should do, you should act. Uh, um, you know, like what was told in your mind. And when it was, when it was stopped by your, you know, that when this cognitive uh, sense became a nonsense and it didn't, did not work the way it was supposed to, um, then what was the next phase? And that kind of situation, um, I think uh, for me, uh, like, you know, if I, if I start, you know, like handling a book in Korean, I don't know, but it will have the similar kind of effects. I'll see some scripts and, you know, kind of imageries, which will create some formations and I'll try to grasp some kind of familiarity in it. But at the end, there is nothing. And that kind of meaningless nothingness, you know, and which sometimes comes as a, a proper language somewhere in this world. And sometimes it comes as a, a not language ever, but you know that the play is there because when you when you accept or acknowledge a language and when you without knowing the other side you completely abandon a language it 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 
it is the same for me then you know like then when what kind of assumption you know you create or you put your power on you know on that kind of um, yeah that 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 kind of judgment and uh, so for me those kind of the form of books or you know like i i lot of my books i also make sculptures i still you know like my past catalogs and um, books on me you know like i i kind of seal them forever so that those history and those kind of things will never come back and nobody will be able to open those books so inside those books are you know there but it's sealed with um, poly polymer and plastic and you know dental polymer or so so that kind of unconst or deconstructing demythifying that kind of form of any kind of construct is my is my is, uh, is what i want to do so book not as a book but something like looks like book but unbooking is what i can say <laughs> Uh, and I just got a message about uh, wrapping up. Um, it was such a wonderful conversation. And something also that I saw throughout your both your works um, was this um, question of sensorial pain. Bonnie, I'm thinking about the uh, man who talked until he disappeared. It's kind of a, a slow pain that you're seeing unravel um, and experiencing when you're looking at that work. And with me too, I've never seen that video with the the tat you having that tattoo being done and me seeing the pain on your face so kind of that was also something um i noticed in your work when you both were when you were discussing and bonnie when you were saying about being in a different world you know um the slowness of time and that man kind of having different um, experiences that's kind of a, also a pain <laughs> um so i wish we had more time to talk because you both your work your practices are so um, vast and, and complex and um, they both deserve so much attention. I'm so glad that you guys could have this time to talk with us and to present um, and thank you again. Thank you and it was also very nice to just to see each other's work. I was really happy to get up uh, be seeing a presentation by Mithu. So thank you uh, um, and that was lovely.